for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is author Ursula Bacon and actor Peter Franzen. Author Ursula Bacon was born and raised in Breslau, Germany, until she was 10 years old. Then she grew up in China, where she went for a, uh, a year and a half to the convent school and got education all different ways when she was in China. Ursula's story from Germany to China to the U.S. is gripping, I must say. I, I couldn't wait to turn the page. <laughs> and I couldn't put down Shanghai Diary, which was uh, published by Dark Horse. Empress, Empress. Yeah. Dark Horse press. So tell us uh, the girl's story from Hitler, hate, to war-torn China. When did you decide to write this? I decided to write it two years ago when my daughter pushed me, said, Mother, are you going to die before you tell us your story? I said, she said, write it at least for us children. And I'm a professional writer. I'm in a literary service. We own a literary service. I said, you know what? I'm going to write it for money. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and then what? Ha then you wrote, I wrote it, it in and ninety could, days, and you you got it. You self published it. Well, I had an offer from a very large house in New York who wanted me to add the gas chambers and ovens and Nazi brutality to a story that was already brutal enough, or oh. it would have not been hysterically true. And I wanted it to be a true story. So you uh, decided to do it yourself. I published it myself and sold just a small run, four thousand copies within a year. Then it was picked up by Mike Richardson as a movie for the movie. It is going to be a it's, movie. It is going to be a movie. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting with Clancy Siegel tonight, who wrote Freedom. I was going to ask you He's about whether the this play, was yes. going to be a movie or yes, not. Yes, it is. Oh, that's fabulous. The thing that entranced me was your use of adjectives and your memory. How, if you just wrote it when you were now, yeah, now, yeah, 70, I don't, yeah. and you're mm, 70, um, how could you remember so much? You know, I'm often asked that question, but the life we led, that was all we had, day after day, we were so s isolated and insulated. And my mother kept saying, well, why don't you remember everything, because one day you're going to tell your children about it. Oh, she because did. Because this is a different time. I had little journals I wrote every once in a while. I wrote something that really touched me. And I grew up, I grew up with adults. I was an, the oldest child you've ever met in your life. When you left Germany, yes. did you know you were going to China? Yes, it was. The, as a matter of fact, my father had been picked up by the Nazis, and the only way we could get him out was to have proof that we're leaving the country. Well, how did you find China to go to? Well, I have to step back a little bit. In 1939, by 1939, in March of 39, America, South America, Canada, North Africa, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. They've all closed their doors against the refugees. Oh. And you know how rumors start? China is an open port. Go to Shanghai. Go to Shanghai. My mother said Marco Polo went there. He came back. She knew that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were raised in a very cultured, uh, li yes, very cultured life cultured in Germany. And very, very, again, just a little, you know, a little world. But a, a nanny and a governess who opened my world. I spoke German, French, and English by the time I was six. Oh, so you and knew. And my parents didn't speak, and of course, only their own languages. So my oh. father had to be picked up within hours of his incarceration, and my uncle was a doer, wheeler, and dealer. Don't ask me how. It's another story. He managed to get three tickets to Shanghai. That's what I wondered. How could you get them? <laughs> well, he has, his name is Baron Erich von Wartenburg. He was a well-known man in town. His uncle, his cousin is the Red Baron, Baron oh. von Richthofen. Oh, whom they named the pizza after in America. <laughs> Wasn't that something? <laughs> but anyway, it, it, again, it's a story in itself. We managed to get tickets, and the night we received the tickets a day, the ship was already leaving Hamburg. So we had seven days to catch it as it made her voyage down the coast of of oh, So you Holland, had to chase, uh, chase the ship? Well, it, we, we, <laughs> had, uh, we <laughs> waited for it to come around back to Genoa. We uh -huh. took a train from Breslau to Genoa. 
oh. and met the ship there and went aboard. And then w was, when you got to China, was it smooth sailing getting to China or how was it? It was very smooth, but we were, we were still a bit frightened because we were on a German ship. Mother oh. kept saying, you know, German ship, German soil, everybody's a Nazi, but we had a wonderful cabin steward who was an older man who was not quite as affected by the disease. Mm. So he was very gracious and very kind to us. And uh, well, coming to Shanghai, of course, this is Shanghai 1939, colonial. It's not today's China with high rises and martinis and Hiltons. Right. It was a grubby, fabulous, teeming, steaming, exotic, smelly city. Well, you get that from the book. I get all the smell and the crud, and I wonder how you could remember all of that oh, crud. I do. I do. <laughs> when I had my first baby, I said, I'm not going to do this because it smells of China. <laughs> <laughs> you remembered those oh, things. Oh, yes. Yeah. And my mother, really, she clutched a hanky to her face, and we always teased her the moment she walked on land, and she never took it off for eight years, we always said. You mean, once you got, as you got off the ship, were you well, shocked? Oh, we were shocked, because I had this beautiful little book in my in my nursery, in my, in my classroom, with little Chinese ladies with lovely silk dresses slid up, big hair, those umbrellas. They walk over little bridges and they feed the little koi fish. <laughs> and they weren't there. Uh, they were screaming, begging children. There were people with huge legs of beriberi. They were littered with, with beggars in illness and coolies and noises and cooking. And, but my father kept saying, I don't want to hear you complain. Only complain uh, if you can change it. Well, those were your formative years, oh, yes. and they were really, I, I mean, you, your parents had to be very careful with you because you could have maybe just gone out of where you were living, and did you ever think of no. joining in with the Chinese? No. <laughs> no, no, as a matter of fact, I knew I had to take care of my parents because they were more lost than I was. Is that right? I was sort of a born adventurer, and I still am. So it was easier for you to get around. Oh, I was excited. I was in China. I'm going to go home and tell my friends that I was in China. You ne you always thought you were going to go home. Oh, yes, of course, for the, for the first two or three years, and until the news came, of course. And then you went to a convent school. You, you were well, Jewish. You were in a Jewish well, ghetto, you said, I know. the way well, you talked. We came it. and we arrived, we lived in a shelter for a day or two, rented a room with some other friends together, new friends. Then we had $500 came to us from America and we moved into the Concession Francaise. How did you get it? How did they find you? Well, How did the mail come? Before, before the war, it still worked, you see. This it was did. still, uh, our money arrived, we picked up our money from the American Express office, which had already existed then. Oh, you, oh, I Shanghai, see. In Shanghai, on ah. the 31st of August, 1939, the next day Hitler marched into Poland. Is that right? September so you wouldn't one. have gotten anything. Mm -hmm. maybe, and you wouldn't have not. been there either. <laughs> well, that's true. But it worked, and we had enough money to live modestly in a tiny little room oh, again. Oh. And the nuns took me in, they took in 15 Jewish children for free. Oh, that's how you got to yes, the convent. Yes, and so my mother, as you said, my mother one day said to my father, you know how they spe used to speak to children behind their back in front of them, and said, what's wrong with her? She crossed herself at dinner. Oh, is I'm a Jew. <laughs> You're a Jew. <laughs> father said, is she breaking out in a rash? She's all right. Let her find a way. So it, was, it seemed like it was a give and take, your well, mother and your father. Your oh, father ho hoisting you up and your mother trying to oh remember yes. the cultural life. She and always had to put the brakes on a little <laughs> bit, but she also <laughs> kept our hearts and our souls together. And then you, I think the inspiration came after you left the school. You talked about the kind of education you had. It wasn't formal. No. It was a ghetto atmosphere. It was where the older Jewish people would say, send me two kids, we're going to talk about Chopin tonight. Is that so right? Off, yes, <laughs> we went to everybody's room. And then for a very short time, a warehouse became available, about the size of the studio, not any bigger. And people would, adults would stand up, and we would gather around them at their feet on a pillow. There was Professor Sauerbruch from Vienna was a throat surgeon who taught us all about throat surgery. You never know when you can use it. But he also Bonaparte aficionado, so we learned all about Bonaparte. Those kind of things. And we just I sat around see. 10 hours a day. Is that right? That's all we had. Because you had all these professionals with you in the ghetto, well, I guess. We didn't have a school anymore. We had no paper. We had no oh. blackboard. We, it was all went into my head. I used to have a secretary years ago. She would call me on the phone and said, give me, give me my, my phone number. I said, why do you always call me for phone numbers? Well, you're quicker than the than the cook. Oh, because you could remember everything. <laughs> we had to remember everything. We had to remember whole Shakespearean plays. 
then what happened? Then you had another inspiration in your religion. Just another more information, I think. I was looking for what I, I was called as a young girl. I was looking for greatness. And I thought it was so great that you shouldn't build a house for it. So I became, you know, I'm a Jew. I, I had my, my, my Christian teaching and then came Yuan Lin, my Buddhist teacher. Oh, you had your Buddhist teacher, right. Oh, he right. was wonderful. He was half breed. He was half Chinese, half English. Brilliant man. And he taught me all the things I needed to know. And now I'm a mixture of everything and don't know what it is, but it works. But what happens is, isn't so much of what he teaches, what was in the Old Testament, what you oh, learned yes. in the convent school, as a does it of fact, all come it, together? It's, as my father said, there's, there's so many roads and only one destination. Oh, that's true, isn't it? And he, he's right. And the older I get, the more I realize that as long as we have love and gratitude in our life, I think we have served whatever master we've chosen to serve. And I think that's what comes out so much. One of my favorite stories was the old lady that you talked about oh, who yeah. sat in the middle of the street that's because right. what she said just warmed my heart all the time. Well, you know, Joan, as a matter of fact, a famous artist, a friend of mine, has just created a painting which is exquisite. And it's going to be posters and greeting cards, and I shall send you one. She would sit in the lane in the little three-legged stool among the feces and the flies and the dead babies. She said, so darling, she had a New York delicatessen accent, I called it. She said, so darling, where are you going today? And I would play her game, and I looked down on her. I said, I told her where I was going. She said, so what do you have to do today? I said, I don't know, Mrs. Goldberg. Well, what does <laughs> Mrs. Goldberg tell you? We played the game. I don't know. She said, well, go out and make a miracle today. God's busy. He can't do it all. I think that's so wonderful, isn't it? And I it? do if it today. You... I take the dawn up in my hand when I leave my house, and I hear her raspy voice. Because that, re that stayed with me, because we're here to make miracles. That's true. We and are. I thought that was so wonderful. Well, are we going to have a second Shanghai Diary? No, we're going to the prequel. <laughs> We're going to have, what is it going to be? It's going to be the, when the, from my father meeting my mother. It's going to be called Eternal Strangers. Oh, it's before. before. We're going to have before. There's no sequel. I came to America. I collected gold bond stamps, raised children, had painted a white picket fence, planted roses, had a wonderful, simple life. And you went to Oregon to live. And then when my first husband died, I remarried, married a young journalist, and we came to Oregon 32 years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's I'm great. I'm an Oregonian now. I, I have web feet and smile when it rains. Ursula Bacon, thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you for writing this book. Well, thank you so thank much you. for having me. And don't go away. We'll be right back with actor Peter Franzen. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actor Peter Franzen, who was born and raised in Finland. He studied at the Theater Academy of Helsinki from 1991 to 1995. He's appeared in many films while working throughout Europe, and he's also played in notable TV roles while he was there. And each year since 1995, He's been nominated for Best Actor or Supporting Actor at uh, various film festivals uh, around the country. Um, and in fact, his film... Um, the Dog Nail Clipper. The Dog Nail Clipper. It's so hard to remember. The Dog Nail Clipper is up for a 2004 uh, UC. Is that the uh, Oscar in Finland? Yeah, that's the equivalent. <laughs> is that the yeah. equivalent? Um, so. Your work in the Dog Nail Clipper. Tell us, before we get to that, tell us how you got started actually in show business because what were you doing? Well, um, my first sort of uh, encounter with, with um, acting uh, was uh, up in Lapland, where I'm from, close to the Arctic Circle, in a local theater. They were um, looking for kids to play uh, in this musical, The Sound of Music. I played <laughs> Kurd, uh, if I remember it correctly. It was a great, great play, and it was a huge success, my first, first, uh, first experience with t theater. And then there were a number of years in between. I was in the Army, and 
I was planning on doing totally something totally different. I was planning on uh, becoming a police officer or a soldier. Really? But, uh, yeah, but um, then I found out that maybe the uniformed uh, <coughs> life was not suitable for me. When you got, when you finished the theater art school, you actually were thinking about doing, being a police officer? No, or? that, that was, uh, that was uh, before that. It was so, before yeah, that? Yeah, I was um, around, I was 19 when I uh, finally uh, finished my military and uh, I got into the theater academy. So, so did you stay in your, did you stay in Finland and work in the theater or did you just right away go out into Europe and look for things to do? No, it's just kind of hard to to leave Finland because uh, every, all the actors basically who are, um, who, who, who've studied at the Theater Academy are employed immediately after they graduate basically. Everybody gets work. It's Is that a right? wonderful system, yeah. Everybody works in the theater, if, um, either in Helsinki or the smaller cities outside or around the country. Um, and um, I chose not to, uh, not to make deals with big theaters, I, I wanted to be a freelance actor, so I, I concentrated my my energy uh, to, to uh, become to become a film actor, and uh, the way I managed to do that. Is there yeah. a big film industry there? No, it's very small. <laughs> uh, you know, the but population is about 5.2 million, so around around 12 films per year. But when I looked at the films you've made, you've made so many films, like just alone in 2004, you made several films. Yeah. So w were you making them in Europe or were you making them in Finland? Well, until this day, most of my films are Finnish. And, uh, you know, there were years that I, uh, that I was in, let's say, four out of eight films in Finland. Is that right? That were, uh, shot in Finland and uh, because 2000, 2004 was an exceptional year for me because I was in six films in five different countries. Oh, in five different countries. Yeah. What about the director? What language did the director speak then in these films? Well, Finnish directors uh, speak Finnish and Swedish. Speak Swedish and uh, Hungarian speak... Uh, do you understand Hungarian. it? Uh, no. <laughs> well, how, that's what I'm wondering. How do they direct you? Yeah, so well... Filmmaking is a universal language, and if if you basically uh, if you've uh, you've managed to uh, learn the language, it's it's pretty easy to uh, understand the the commands and and uh, the technique is is the same everywhere. So, so when you're <laughs> making a film in Sweden or Germany, and you're being directed in German or Swedish, what language do you speak? Uh, I speak German and, and Swedish. Oh, you do? Yeah. Finland is a, a bilingual country. Uh, oh. The five five percent of the population oh. speaks Swedish, oh. and most of the rest uh, speak uh, Finnish. It's their uh, mother tongue. I see. Yeah. So since 1999, when you came to America, did you come right to California? Yes, I did. I just fell in love with this place, uh, the nature, and and uh, even the city. Although in the beginning it was kind of weird, of course. Weren't there a lot of people <laughs> for yeah, you? Well, twice the, uh, at least twice, twice the amount of the population of Finland. And uh, of course, I've never been living anywhere else except in, in, in Finland and, and occasionally on, on work trips around the Europe. But, but uh, yeah, I felt kind of large and uh, in, incomprehensible in a way. But now it's not, you know, it has shrunk a little bit. And yeah, well, I've been here for five years. And, yeah, I find it. I find it very nice. When you uh, came, did you think you were going to break into show business? I mean, did you come to act? Yeah, of course. That's my that's my goal. That's, and, that's uh, right. and and what has it been difficult? Yeah, it is a whole different ball game, as you as you say. Um, and uh, but I've, I've been I've been fortunate to be able to travel to Europe and uh, do my stuff there and and try to build up the career here from scratch basically it's kind of weird to like that's most of people know a lot of a lot of people know that it's kind of weird to start from from scratch all over again but you know it's, it's uh rejuvenating it's refreshing in a way i know but that's what i would think too because you you had so much work there 
and you were, you know, um, notable in what you did, and you got awards, and then you come here. Obviously, the people in Europe remember who you are because you've been called back and forth and cast in films there. Yeah. So, but more films there than here. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, I've been, I've worked here in a, in a couple of um, independent films and then some TV series, just little parts, small parts. But uh, finally, we've we've been working. My wife is an actress as well, and she's from Finland. And uh, and uh, actually, there's a movie that we've been working on for the past two years, and then we started with eight thousand dollars or something like that. The script is great, it's written, and uh, the film is uh, directed by the screenplayer, uh, screenwriter, uh, Ann Norder, and uh, oh, yeah. she's half Finnish as well. And it's, it's a wonderful play about two artists, two painters, um, that, that, and it takes place in New York in a loft. Everything takes place in a loft, so it was kind of controllable uh, in that sense with that kind of Budget. Exactly. And Have you started shooting? Yeah, we've. It's uh, it's al already. <coughs> it's al almost done now. We're in post production now. But the thing that you ready. bring to it, even though it's an independent and it's a small budget, I mean, if your w wife is a professional actress and you're a professional actor, and she, she's a wonderful screenwriter, right? Um, playwright. Yeah, and, and an order, yeah. Yeah, and well known. So I mean, you should be really being able to draw on what you have rather than worrying about, you know, big budget stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a challenge. I've, I've, it's been a long time since I've been in, a, in a, such a low budget film, but now the budget is bigger. We got, we got investors here and we're looking for distribution. What's uh, the name the of film. it? Its, it's name is uh, uh, Red is the Color Off. Oh. Uh, it's, a, it's a triangle drama thing. And, and is it in English? Of course, yeah. Of course. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm speaking to a... It was made here. I'm speaking to someone here, from so. who speaks all these different languages. Um, tell me about this film, The Dog Nail Clipper. Okay. Tell me about that, because it starts after World War II, I guess. Yeah. Um, the film is based on a book by the same name, by this great Finnish uh, satiric... I guess mm -hmm. you can say it like that. And usually his books are really, really funny. And uh, this is probably the most uh, serious of his novels. Um, but we, of course, we went to put some, some um, amusing moments into film as well. And it is, it is a wonderful and warm film about, about brotherhood, about uh, tolerance, acceptance, and, and uh, about good people. Tell us about your character, because well, I think yeah. what happens is after the Russians invaded Finland, they right? tried to. They tried to. They tried oh, to. that's good. Okay, tell us from there. Okay, well, <laughs> they tried to. Yeah, it, the whole war thing, the Second World War, um, the history of that in Finland was it went something like this: that um, October 1939, uh, the Soviet army. Stalin and his generals decided to invade Finland along with all the other uh, Baltic countries and they made a pact with uh, Hitler that Finland is part of their uh, expansion plan. So they conquered all the, all the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, oh. Oh. and the uh, uh, Soviet Union claimed that Finns started the war by by uh, attacking a small village on the on the Soviet side of the border in Karelia, and the the thing was, however, that the Soviet army bombed it itself, oh. and uh, they claimed so. I guess uh, globally, they were they thought that they would that their actions would be uh, approved. And uh, Stalin and his generals wanted to march to the core of Finland and to the capital of Helsinki, the capital of Helsinki, and uh, have their victory parade on the streets of Helsinki in two weeks. However, uh, and our, 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 the Finnish army was outnumbered by something like ten, ten to I one. Know. Or something yes, like that. I know. Yes, I know. How'd you stop them? Well, <laughs> very persistent 
guys on, on the front in the woods and, and guerrilla war and um, very rough winter. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunate events happened to those guys who were from Ukraine, never saw the winter or something like that. And oh, the war took oh. quite a long time until 1944. We lost the war because uh, the Soviet Union ended uh, war action uh, against uh, Germany, so they could put all their equipment to the Finnish border. So that's basically the history but, of that. But we take you where you were damaged, you were hurt in the war, your character had your hair, head blown off. Well, yeah, there you, was had, a you had a wound in your head. Yeah. And you, how did you research that? Because you play uh, a person who is is um there's brain damage brain way, yeah. damage yeah yeah well it's a, it was an interesting task of of course the novel um, um had had a lot of stuff in it to to for an actor to uh grab and and start working uh with that you kept material but moving your face and your eye was did they do makeup did they do something to your eye yeah yeah i had a contact lens like this big and it was oh. kind of horrible but <laughs> it worked on the film it, it was worked fine but i i did research about brain damage i talked to doctors and uh and uh i i guess i rehearsed the the part for about four months oh you did like oh, yeah. so you became that person well it was um I saw it at the Scandinavian Film Festival, and I think one of the things that the film festival had in common, all the films, was that it was really cold. <laughs> all of those films, yeah, a lot of films yeah, are in actually, really cold. That's pretty funny, yeah. <laughs> Do you ski? Of course, you know, you can't, you won't survive. That's what I wondered. I, I, and the other thing that I thought was so, like the continuity was the color of the landscape and the color of the, of the, films were so bright. Were they very true to what it is there? Well, yeah, Finland is a very sort of a lush country, a lot of forest and uh, 200,000 lakes. And uh, it's a, Finland is the size of California, basically. Well, it was really beautiful. And I thank you, Peter Franzen, well, for coming you. on and telling us about the dog nail clipper. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, um, Los Angeles 90017. We'll see you next time. <laughs>